Probate Estates, presented by Kelly Herzig. You've heard the old adage, you can't take it with you. You may be wondering why we are covering probate estates in a business law course. Well, any good business person will tell you how important it is to have a business plan in order to have a successful business. Writing a will or creating a trust, having a plan for how your estate will be handled after your death can provide you with the opportunity to set out your long-term plan for the business. You'll be able to provide instructions on how you expect the company to be maintained when you eventually pass away. Neglecting such aspects could ruin the future of the business in the long term, particularly if your business is not a corporation, since with many business forms, the death of the owner or a partner can terminate the business. Good estate planning can be vital to you for your peace of mind and to your heirs and your business. So what are we going to cover in this section? We're going to be covering wills, intestacy laws, trusts, and some other estate planning issues. The first major topic we will cover in this lesson are wills. A will is the final declaration of how a person desires to have their property disposed of after death. A will is also referred to as a testamentary disposition of property. A will is a formal instrument that must follow exactly the requirements of state law to be effective. Besides the distribution of property, a will can appoint a guardian for minor children or incapacitated adults, or appoint a personal representative to settle the affairs of the deceased. A person who makes a will is a testator, from the Latin word testari, to make a will. One who dies after making a valid will is said to have died testate. The court responsible for administering and ruling on issues surrounding a will is called a probate court. In Sedgwick County, the probate court is a separate specialty court, though smaller counties do not have a probate court separate from the district court. That's usually out in western Kansas. When a person dies, a personal representative administers the estate and settles all the decedent's affairs. An executor is a personal representative named in a will, whereas an administrator is a personal representative appointed by the court for a decedent that dies without a will. A court will appoint a representative when the will does not name one, the named executor is deceased, or the named person lacks capacity to serve as an executor. A person that dies without a will is said to have died intestate, meaning state intestacy laws will govern the distribution to any legal heirs. We will discuss those laws in a later slide. If there are no heirs able to be located, the estate will escheat, meaning it will revert to the state. A gift of real estate is called a devise, while a gift of personal property or money is called a bequest or legacy. The recipient of a devise is called a devisee, while a recipient of a legacy is called a legatee. Next, we will discuss types of gifts. Probate laws vary state by state, but in general, to probate a will means to establish its validity and to carry out the administration of the estate through a court proceeding in probate court. If a decedent's assets are not sufficient to cover all the gifts in the will, an abatement will be necessary. An abatement is just a reduction of the gift. In a will, gifts can be specific, general, or residuary. We'll begin with specific devises or bequests. A particular gift that can be distinguished from all the rest of the testator's property, such as the family home identified by address, a specific device, or my gold pocket watch, a specific bequest or legacy. Then there are general devises or bequests. This is a gift that does not single out any particular item or property to be transferred by will, such as all my real estate or all my jewelry. It can have a dollar amount, such as $50,000 cash or two diamonds worth $10,000 without specifying which diamonds. Then there are residuary gifts. Sometimes a will provides that any assets remaining after the payment of debts and distributions of specific gifts are to be distributed through a residuary clause. Residuary clauses are used when the exact amount to be distributed cannot be determined until all the other gifts and payouts have been made. 
If no beneficiary is named in a residuary clause, it generally passes according to state laws of intestacy. Let's talk about abatement. I mentioned that before. If the assets are insufficient to pay in full all the general bequests, an abatement takes place, meaning that the beneficiaries or the legatees receive a reduced payout. For example, if the will states that each of three children will receive $10,000, but the estate only contains $15,000 instead of $30,000, each child will get $5,000. They take an abatement of an additional $5,000. Then there is a lapsed legacy. This occurs if a legatee predeceases the testator. However, if the deceased legatee is a close blood relation, such as a child, grandchild, or sibling, the legacy does not fail, but instead goes to their heirs. Next, we will discuss the requirements for a valid will. A will must comply with statutory formalities designed to ensure that the testator understood their actions at the time the will was made and executed. These formalities are intended to prevent fraud, and unless they are followed, the will is declared void and the property is distributed according to intestacy laws. The formalities vary by jurisdiction, but most states have certain basic requirements for executing a will. Most states require proof of the testator's capacity, testamentary intent, a written document, the testator's signature, and the signature of the persons who witnessed the testator signing the will, usually two witnesses. Of the specific requirements for a valid will, we will first discuss testamentary capacity. For a will to be valid, the testator must have testamentary capacity. This means the testator must be of legal age and sound mind at the time the will is made. The legal age in most states, including Kansas, is 18 years of age, or 16 for a married minor. Being a sound mind refers to the testator's general ability to understand the nature and extent of his or her property, who were the natural beneficiaries, the dispositions being made, and how these relate to form an orderly disposition of property. Basically, they need to understand that they are making a will, what property they have to gift, and who their natural heirs might be. It's a low standard and does not require exact or explicit knowledge, particularly about the value and scope of the property they own. Persons who have been declared by a court to be mentally incompetent do not meet the sound mind requirement. However, as long as there is no adjudication by a court or a guardian appointed, in many states, someone who lacks contractual mental capacity can still make a will. The next requirement for a valid will is intent. A valid will is one that represents a person's intention to transfer and distribute their property. Any intent to disinherit, which means leave nothing to an heir, needs to be clear, and there are some state laws that protects against accidental disinheritance and that protect minor children. Then there is undue influence. This is a topic we've discussed before in contracts. When it can be shown that a testator's will was a result of fraud or undue influence, the will is declared invalid. Undue influence involves a situation in which a party uses their power to take advantage of his or her dominant position in the relationship to persuade the other party to enter into the will. It interferes with the other person's ability to make his or her own decision concerning the will and how assets will be transferred. Courts may sometimes infer undue influence when the named beneficiary was in a position to influence the making of the will. For example, suppose an elderly woman has two living children, but she has an in-home nurse. If the woman leaves her estate not to her two children, but to her nurse, a presumption of undue influence will probably arise if the children sue to invalidate the will. Next, we will discuss writing and signature requirements for a valid will. Generally, a will must be in writing, though it can be informal as long as it substantially complies with the state's statutory requirement. Some states allow handwritten wills in ink in the testator's handwriting, which is known as a holographic will. These are not allowed in Kansas, though they are in Oklahoma and Nebraska, for instance. A non will, an oral will, is not allowed in most states. 
The few states that do allow them require them to be made before witnesses during the last illness of a testator, their deathbed wills, and can only transfer personal property, not real property. A fundamental requirement is that the testator's signature must appear on the will. Unlike general contracts where the signature can be anywhere on the document, with respect to wills, the signature generally has to be at the end. Kansas law requires the signature to be at the end of a will. It does not need to be a full signature, but can be a mark or initials. The signature will generally be valid if the testator intends his or her mark to be a signature on the will. We will discuss the last requirement for a valid will, which is witnesses. A will must generally be witnessed by at least two witnesses, like in Kansas, though some states require three witnesses. Witnessing a will means to actually watch a testator sign the will, then sign as a witness. In some states like Kansas, a testator can direct a third party to sign on their behalf if they cannot physically sign, they can't even make a mark, usually due to illness, but they must verbally acknowledge their will as their own and the witnesses swear or attest to hearing the testator acknowledge the will as his own. By observing the actual signing or acknowledgement, the witnesses can attest to the signature if it is ever challenged. The requirements for being a witness are generally set by statute, but some states require the witnesses to be disinterested, meaning they are not a beneficiary. Most states require the witness to be at least 18 years of age and mentally competent. In Kansas, if a beneficiary signs as a witness, they can lose the gift left to them in the will. To summarize, a valid will in Kansas must be in writing, it must be signed at the end by the person making the will, the testator, or by someone else in the presence of and at the express direction of the testator. It must be signed by two or more competent witnesses who saw the testator sign the will or heard him or her acknowledge the will. Kansas also allows a will to be self-proving. A self-proving will speeds up probate because the court can accept the will without contacting the witnesses who signed it. To make a will self-proving, the testator and both witnesses will go before a notary and sign an affidavit under oath that proves who everyone is and that the testator knew he or she was signing a will and that the witnesses knew they were witnessing a will and signing the will as witnesses. The next topic I want to cover is revocation of wills. The testator can revoke a will at any time during their lifetime by either physically destroying it or by making a new subsequent will. Wills can also be revoked by operation of law by court order. Revocation can be partial or complete and must follow certain strict requirements. The first way a will can be revoked is by physical act. A testator can revoke a will by intentionally burning it, tearing it, canceling it, obliterating it, or otherwise destroying it. A testator can also direct someone else to destroy the will in his or her presence. If a state statute requires a certain type of physical act needed for destruction, generally only those methods will be allowed. In some states, a testator can revoke parts of a will by crossing out selected sections, leaving some sections as valid. However, if a section is crossed out, a substituted section cannot be added in its place without the will being re-signed and re-witnessed. Next, we will discuss revocation by a subsequent writing. A will can be revoked in whole or in part by a subsequent will amendment called a codicil. Creation of a codicil eliminates the need to redo the whole will for just an amendment. A codicil must be executed with the same formalities as a will with the required number of competent witnesses. The prior will's remaining unchanged terms are incorporated by reference into the codicil. An entirely new will can also revoke an old will, but will need to have language that expressly states all other prior wills are revoked. If a second will does not have that revocation language, then the existing wills are read together. But if there's a conflict in any provision, the later will will control.
The last way a will can be revoked is by operation of law. This occurs when marriage, divorce, annulment, or the birth of a child takes place after a will has been executed. In most states, if a testator marries after executing a will and the will does not provide for the spouse, the spouse can still receive a share of the probate estate, basically what they would receive if there had been no will. However, if there was a valid prenuptial agreement, its provisions will control what the new spouse may receive. A divorce or annulment does not revoke the entire will. In some states, a divorce or annulment will revoke a gift made to a former spouse. If a child is born after a will is executed, that child may be entitled to a portion of the estate. Most state laws allow a child to receive a portion of a parent's estate, even if no provision is made for the child, unless it is clear from the will that the testator intended to disinherit the child. Next, we will discuss the rights of a spouse under a will. The law imposes certain limitations on the way a person can dispose of property under a will. A married person cannot usually avoid leaving a certain portion of their estate to a surviving spouse unless there is a valid prenuptial agreement. In most states, this is known as receiving an elective share or forced share of the estate. It is usually one third of the estate or an amount equal to what the spouse would have received if there had been no will under intestacy laws. A spouse can renounce or disclaim the amount in the will in favor of the forced share if it is larger than the actual gift in the will. This allows the spouse to receive whichever distribution is more advantageous, meaning bigger. Next, we will discuss probate procedures. Probate is the court process by which a will is proved valid or invalid. While the procedures vary by state, Typically, the type of probate proceeding needed to probate a will depends on the size of the estate, whether minor children are involved, and whether title to real property needs to be transferred by the court. For smaller estates, many states allow for an informal probate proceeding. If there's no real property, personal property such as cars, jewelries, and savings and checking accounts can either be transferred by a sworn affidavit or by filling out the required probate forms. Real property transfers generally require a court order, but that too can be streamlined, particularly if there are no objections by the heirs. Larger estates normally require a formal probate proceeding due to the complexity of the estate. The probate court supervises the entire process and rules on any will contests. If minor children are involved and the children need a guardian appointed, a formal probate proceeding is necessary. Now, often people can avoid the cost of probate by employing various will substitutes, such as living trusts, life insurance policies, and retirement accounts with named beneficiaries. Another way to transfer property outside of probate is to give inter vivos gifts to your children or heirs. Next, we will discuss intestacy laws. Each state regulates by statute how property will be distributed when a person dies intestate, meaning without a will. Intestacy laws attempt to carry out the intent of the deceased, assuming they would want to leave their property to their natural heirs, spouses, children, grandchildren, siblings, or other family members. Each state has rules for the priority of heirs on who gets a distribution from the estate. If there are no heirs, the estate reverts to the state by a sheet. Generally, debts of the deceased are paid first, then the remaining assets pass to the surviving spouse and children. Typically, the spouse gets one half the estate if there is one legal child and one third if there are two or more children. A legal child is either born to or adopted by the deceased. Stepchildren are not covered by intestacy laws. Only if there are no surviving children or grandchildren will the spouse receive the entire estate. If a deceased person has been preceded in death by one or more of their children, if the deceased child had children, those children may step into the shoes of their parent and receive their parent's share of the grandparent's estate. This is known as Presterpe's intestate distribution. Kansas uses this method. For example, suppose Betty dies without a will. Betty is a widow with no spouse. Betty had two children during her life, Larry and Bob. Larry is living, but Bob died several years before Betty. 
However, Bob had two children, Mark and Mary. Using purse derpies and test date rules, Larry will get one half of his mother Betty's estate. If Bob had been living, he would have received the other half, but his children, Mark and Mary, inherit in his stead. Mark will get one fourth of Betty's estate and Mary will get one fourth. Some states use a per capita distribution method instead of per sterpes, meaning each person in a class or group takes an equal share. Using the above example, if the distribution were per capita, then Betty's three living heirs, Larry, Mark, and Mary, would each get one third of the estate. The next topic we're going to cover in this lesson is trusts. A trust is any arrangement by which property is transferred from one person to a trustee to be administered for the transferors or other beneficiaries benefit. It can also be defined as a right of property, real or personal, held by one party for the benefit of another. The trustee holds that property for the trust's beneficiaries, invests the trust assets, and administers the trusts according to the terms created by the trust. Trusts can be created either to become effective during a person's lifetime or after a person's death. Trusts may be created for an, any lawful purpose and can either be expressed or implied. The essential elements of a trust are a designated beneficiary, except for charitable trusts, a designated trustee, a fund, which is called a trust corpus, sufficiently identifiable to enable title to pass to the trustee, and actual delivery of the trust corpus by the settler or grantor who creates the trust to the trustee with the intent of passing title. Next, we will discuss express trusts. An express trust is one that is created in explicit terms, usually in writing. There are numerous types of express trusts, such as a living trust, which is an inter vivos trust. It is a trust created during the grantor's lifetime. Living trusts have become popular estate planning options because at the grantor's death, assets held in a living trust can pass to heirs without going through probate. If a living trust is revocable, the grantor retains control of the trust assets during their life and must pay income taxes on all the trust earnings. If a living trust is irrevocable, the grantor permanently gives up control of the property to the trustee and does not pay taxes on trust earnings, though the grantor will have to pay income tax on any trust income distributions paid to them. Then there is a testamentary trust. This is a trust created by will and comes into existence at the grantor's death. There are charitable trusts. This is a trust created with the goal of charitable, educational, religious, or scientific purposes, and unlike most trusts, can last indefinitely. Then there are spendthrift trusts. This is created to provide maintenance to a beneficiary, but prevent him or her from wasting an inheritance. It also prohibits creditors generally from touching the funds. The other type of trust is an implied trust. Sometimes a trust will be imposed, implied by law, even in the absence of an express trust. Implied trusts include constructive trusts and resulting trusts. A constructive trust is imposed by the court in the interest of fairness. In a constructive trust, the owner of the property is declared to be a trustee for the parties who are, in equity, actually entitled to the benefits that flow from the trust. Courts often impose a constructive trust when someone who is in a confidential or fiduciary relationship with another person, such as a guardian to a ward, that has breached a duty to that person, or if a party obtains title to property by fraud or breach of a legal duty, a court will usually impose a constructive trust to protect the one who was defrauded. A resulting trust arises from the conduct of the parties. A trust results when the circumstances create an inference or apparent intention that one holding legal title does so for the benefit of another. Next, we will discuss trust termination. The terms of a trust should expressly state the event on which the grantor wishes the trust to terminate, such as the beneficiary's or the trustee's death. If the trust instrument does not expressly state when a trust will terminate, neither the beneficiary's death nor the trustee's death ends the trust, but it cannot go on indefinitely. Typically, a trust will have an end date or a triggering event that ends the trust. 
For example, an educational trust for a child's higher education might end when the beneficiary graduates or reaches the age of 25, whichever is earlier. A trust may end when the purpose of the trust is fulfilled. If a trust's purpose becomes impossible or illegal, the trust will terminate. In addition, if the trust's assets become too small to justify the continued administration of the trust, the trustee can end the trust. In Kansas, non-economic trusts with a value of less than $100,000 can be ended at the trustee's discretion. We will close this lesson by discussing some other estate planning issues. The first one is buy-sell agreements. A buy and sell agreement is a legally binding contract that stipulates how a partner's share of a business may be reassigned if that partner dies or leaves the business. They're often referred to as a business will or business prenup. A typical agreement might stipulate that a deceased partner's interest be sold back to the business or the remaining owners. In the case of the death of a partner, the estate must agree to sell. This prevents the estate from selling the interest to an outsider. Buy-sell agreements are commonly used by sole proprietorships, partnerships, and closed corporations in an attempt to smooth transitions in ownership when each partner dies, retires, or decides to exit the business. The buy and sell agreement requires that the business share be sold to the company or the remaining members of the business according to a predetermined valuation formula usually laid out in the agreement. The last three estate planning tools I want to discuss are powers of attorney, durable power of attorney for health care, and living wills. We've talked about powers of attorneys before, but I think I want to refresh your memory of what they are and how they operate in the probate arena. First, let's discuss just a regular power of attorney. In estate planning, a power of attorney will give the agent the right to act on behalf of the grantor with respect to the disposition of property. Powers of attorney can either be general with broad authority or special with limited or specific stated powers, which is recommended, particularly if the holder of the power of attorney is a family member. Then there are durable powers of attorney for health care. This is a power of attorney that allows a third party to act for the grantor when they become incapacitated and unable to make medical decisions for themselves. It must be executed before the grantor is incapacitated. Finally, there is the living will. A living will is not really a will. It is an advanced health care directive that allows a person to control what medical treatment may be used after a serious accident or illness, such as a life-saving measure, like do not resuscitate orders. Now, some states, like Kansas, recognize a living will, but the law does not hold that they are binding. They are viewed as a suggestion or an expression of the wishes of the person signing them. Therefore, many people who use living wills do so in conjunction with giving a durable power of attorney for health care to a trusted family member or friend who knows their wishes as expressed in the living will and who they trust to carry out those wishes using the power of attorney. This is the end of the probate estates supplement.